Late one Christmas day, a resident of the posh community of Hillsboro, California, accompanied by his wife and his children, set out to sing Christmas carols to their neighbors. As they were tuning up outside their first stop, the woman of the house came to the door. She looked distraught. She said, look, fellow, I'm just too busy. The plumbing's on the brink. I can't get anybody to fix it. And there's a mob coming for dinner. If you really feel like singing carols, come back about nine o'clock, okay? Yes, ma'am, replied the man respectfully as he herded his family elsewhere. That man's name was Bing Crosby. Even Jesus felt rejection in his hometown. In Luke 4, 16 through 22, you have an amazing text. Luke refers to our Lord's homecoming, to the city of Nazareth, where he had been brought up, and the rejection that he faced there. It was on this occasion that Jesus read the deliverance prophecy and applied it to himself. Let's see what we can learn today as we study rejection at Nazareth. First of all, in our text, we see that Jesus went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day. Reading with me from Luke 4, 16. And he came to Nazareth where he'd been brought up. And as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up for to read. Ever since his return from Egypt when he was young, Nazareth had been our Lord's hometown. And as he went down the street, he would be able to greet people by name as he passed them and they would know who he was. This was his town, and these were his people. But when he returned, something was different about Jesus. And on the first Sabbath after his return, he went into the synagogue. And it says, as his custom was. That shows us that our Lord attended regularly in the services of the synagogue on the Sabbath day. And the Lord Jesus must have been filled with delight to attend his home synagogue. As a boy, he would attend there to study and to worship on the Sabbath. I think about what a tragedy it is for children to be deprived of Bible teaching in weekly Bible school on Sundays and on Wednesdays and of the worship of the Lord's church. And how blessed are children whose parents realize their responsibility to educate their children in the word of God and provide those weekly opportunities for them. Now it's believed that the synagogues were established after the Jews returned from uh, the captivity of Babylon. During the exile, of course, the temple of Jerusalem was inaccessible to them. But they needed mutual encouragement in the practice of their religion. The Bible says they came together in Ezekiel's house. Ezekiel chapters 8 and 20 and also in other places. And they kept their worship alive with prayer in their identity alive with instruction in the sacred writings. And then when they returned home, back to their homeland, they continued this practice in the synagogue. 
Now in the synagogue there would be rough wooden seats for the men on the one side and for the women on the other. There was an ark of painted wood which contained the library of sacred scrolls of the law and the prophets. That was the most precious possession of the synagogue. There would be alms boxes near the door for the poor. There would be notice boards on which were written the names of offenders who had been cast out of the synagogue. According to Barclay, the synagogue service included three parts. There was the worship part in which prayer was offered. Secondly, there was the reading of the scriptures. In the center of the synagogue was a raised platform and uh, on this platform, the readers would stand to read along with interpreters who would translate from Hebrew to Aramaic. The law was divided into 154 sections to be read so that the books could be covered completely every three years. And then following the reading of uh, uh, the prophets after, after the law. It's believed that that reading was not fixed, but the reading of the prophets would be selected by the reader. We'll see the importance of that in a moment. Then third, you had the teaching part. Following the reading of the prophets came what we would call a sermon or a word of exhortation. And that was an important part of the synagogue service. Anyone competent might be invited to bring the sermon for the day. In Antioch of Pisidia, Paul was given the opportunity to speak in a synagogue following the reading of scripture in Acts 13, 15. On this Sabbath day was one in their midst who had come back home to Nazareth. His fame was heralded throughout the nation, and yet he was there with them in the services of the synagogue on the Sabbath day, and he was there not just to sit, not to attend, but to take an active part. And so Jesus stood up for to read. It was our Lord's custom to attend public worship and his followers ought to imitate the same. He lived under the old covenant. He kept the good customs of those who lived under the law of Moses. And this was a good custom. Today we live under the new custom. The new covenant. And uh, we meet for worship not on the Sabbath day, but on the Lord's day. The day of our Lord's resurrection. But that same love for God and for his word and, <clears throat> and for his people that motivate our Lord to customarily go to the synagogue on the Sabbath day ought to motivate the people of God to worship him and to learn from his word and to gather with his people. We had a wonderful, wonderful gospel meeting recently. You know, we had people drive well over an hour to come to our gospel meeting. And some came back a second night. And how does that compare with those who would not even drive across town? In Hebrews chapter 10, 24 and 25, let us consider one another to provoke and to love and good works. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of custom of some is, but exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching. Some have not adopted this custom of our Lord. I drove by the golf course today and there are people all over the golf course. And I thought about a young man in Kentucky who was once in my youth group and he got a little too good at golf and started playing golf tournaments on Sunday and he began choosing golf over God. 
And then he no longer had this custom that our Lord did. We need to make it our custom, as the Lord did, to assemble for public worship and Bible study for the church. Jesus went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, number two. Jesus opened the book. Verse 17, and there was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written. So he stands up in the synagogue, and this indicates to everybody his desire to read. It was that time of the service. And there is brought to him the book of the prophet Isaiah. Probably the law had already been uh, read. And now, according to custom, they're ready for the usual reading of the prophets. Jesus opened the book. It's unfortunate that some people rarely ever open the book of God. The Bible has been the world's bestseller for centuries. From the time it came forth from Gutenberg's printing press at the end of the 15th century, it has outsold every book of every age. But despite the number of copies sold and despite our reverence for it, few find the time to open it and read it and know its contents. Do you spend more time reading on the internet than you do reading in your Bible? Open the book. And when Jesus opened the book, he was opening the book of Isaiah. Jesus' Bible was the Old Testament. That was the foundation of all Jewish education. And like all Jewish children, Jesus would have been trained from early childhood in those 39 books. And our Lord frequently quoted from the Law, the Prophets, and the Psalms. It's very unfortunate that many of us may be well, reclaimed, uh, well acquainted with the New Testament, but only have a nodding acquaintance with the book that Jesus knew so well. It's true that we're now living under the new and better covenant, but it's also true that our lack of knowledge of the old covenant deprives many of us of valuable insights in the new covenant. And Paul insists in Romans 15, 4, whatsoever things are written aforetime are written for our learning that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. Jesus said in John 5, 39, search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. When Jesus told them to search the scriptures, he was speaking of the Old Testament scriptures. And of those Old Testament scriptures, Jesus said, they are they which testify of me. And again, in Luke 24, 44, he said to them, these are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled, which are written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. In the fulfilling of many Prophecies of the Old Testament concerning Christ are great a great proof of the inspiration of the Bible. And many of the important truths of the New Testament are based on events of the past. The admonition of Jesus to remember Lot's wife and the story of Moses lifting up the serpent and the selling of Esau's birthright and the praying of Elijah and the salvation of Noah and on and on all form a part in helping us to understand and to illustrate what New Testament Christianity is all about. Who has not been inspired by the thrilling stories of men and women who, as Hebrews eleven thirty three 33 and 34 says, who through faith subdued kingdoms, wrought righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the violence of fire, Escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, waxed vain in fight, turned to flight the armies of the aliens. 
We need to open the book of the Old Testament as well as the book of the New Testament and read. Jesus did. Jesus opened the book. Number three, Jesus found the place and read. In Luke 4, 17, there was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Isaiah, and when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. He found the place. Now, could you find the place in the book of Isaiah where it is written, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me? Today we might cheat. We might use our search engines, right? Jesus was familiar enough with the book that he could find the place. And by book, not like our books, the book of Isaiah at that time was a scroll. And there were no chapter and verse divisions. So that meant that Jesus was familiar enough with the content to be able to find the right place. Some would have difficulty finding the place even if they were told that the passage is Isaiah 61 in verse 1. I remember that as a little boy in Bible class, the teachers would often have what they called a sword drill. You remember those? And that meant that the teacher would call out a passage of scripture. And all of us would race and see who could find the verse first. And that was a good way for us to be familiar with our Bibles. We not only need to open the book, but we need to be familiar enough with it that we can find the place. Jesus found the place and read. He read Isaiah 61, 1 and 2, which says, The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the, to the captives, and the opening of the prison to them that are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God to comfort all that mourn. We call that the deliverance prophecy. He quotes that, and he refers directly to himself from that passage as the Messiah. In this portion of Isaiah's prophecy, the character and the mission of the Messiah is given. As an evangelist, he's anointed to preach the gospel to the poor. As a liberator, he sent to preach deliverance to the captives. As a revealer, he brought recovery of sight to the blind. As a comforter, he healed the brokenhearted. And how different was Isaiah's inspired picture of the Messiah with the preconceived picture in the minds of many of the Jews. Those pictures didn't really match up. The passage that Jesus read pictures the Messiah not as some mighty temporal ruler leading some military rebellion. No, as a minister to the sick, to the afflicted, a teacher of the neglected, the savior and comforter of the oppressed. He would proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. And in the Old Testament, on the first day of the year of Jubilee, the priests went through the land and they would proclaim the blessings of that year. Jesus proclaimed the time in the Christian dispensation when God would receive sinners according to the truth of the gospel. The deliverer was here. Eventually he would deliver God's judgment, but now was the time for delivering God's grace. His public ministry had begun. He found the place. He read the scripture. And he was speaking of himself. And then fourth, 
Jesus closed the book. In verse 20, and he closed the book. And he gave it again to the minister and sat down. And the eyes of all them that were in the synagogue were fastened on him. And he began to say unto them, This day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. Now this is, this is very vivid. What Jesus did here in this synagogue in his own hometown. He quietly rolls up the scroll. He gives it to the attendant who's brought it to him. Then he sits down. Now he's assuming the position of the teacher. The custom was you stand while reading and you sit while teaching. That was the custom. Now he sits down. Now he's ready to teach. And all the eyes of the synagogue are fastened on Jesus. Their attention is riveted on him. And they're not prepared for the bombshell that he was about to drop in their midst. Our Savior said, This day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. With this stunning announcement, he claimed to be the Messiah of which Isaiah had written. He told people in his hometown that he was the fulfillment of Isaiah's deliverer prophecy. And he wanted those of his hometown to be the first to know of his calling and his mission. How sad he must have been at their rejection of his words. He could see it in their faces. He could see it in their hearts. And in verse 22, and all bear him witness and wondered at the gracious words which proceeded out of his mouth. And they said, is not this Joseph's son? They heard him at first. And they were amazed by his words and they were stunned by his ability to speak. And yet they could not believe that, that Jesus would be the one to whom the prophets pointed after all. Well, they've known him his whole life. They need more evidence than that. They saw only the son of Mary and of Joseph. They watched him grow up in their own city. They wanted to see some of these miracles they've been hearing about. Why hadn't he done any in, in his own city of Nazareth? And so in his own hometown, the Lord was met with skepticism and disbelief. And they were just unable to accept the possibility that he could be the long-awaited Messiah. Now look at verse 24, where Jesus says, Verily I say unto you, no prophet is accepted in his own country. The familiarity of the people of Nazareth with Jesus and his family blinded them to the truth of his identity. They could not reconcile the Jesus they knew as the carpenter's son with the divine authority that was his. Familiarity breeded contempt. Didn't take long for their admiration to turn into antagonism. Jesus refers to Elijah and Elisha to show it wasn't a new thing for a prophet to be despised in his own country. Both of them were driven by unbelief to work miracles among the Gentiles rather than in their own country. And because of their prejudices and because of their unwillingness to believe, Jesus had to go work in other places beside Nazareth. Now verses 28 and 29. And all they in the synagogue when they heard these things were filled with wrath and rose up and thrust him out of the city and led him into the brow of the hill whereon their city was built that they might cast him down headlong. They were incensed. Murder was in their hearts. They pushed 
they shoved, they dragged Jesus to the edge of a cliff that they might hurl him down on the rocks below. And then you have verse 30. But he, passing through the midst of them, went his way. They intended to kill Jesus. Just like that young man last night. Intended to murder a former president of the United States. But verse 30 says, But he passing through the midst of them went on his way. Somehow, some way, he was gone. And they had no one on him to vent their hatred. I guess it was with heavy heart that the Lord went on to Capernaum. Rejection's hard to bear, especially in your hometown. I want to make three points of application briefly in closing today. Number one, like Jesus, we must courageously proclaim the truth even when it's met with resistance or rejection. That's number one. Number two, like Jesus, we must recognize the danger of familiarity and be willing to challenge our own preconceived ideas to remain open to God's truth, even when it challenges our beliefs. And then number three, like Jesus, we've got to be prepared to face rejection of the gospel message while continuing to do his will. Our Lord's rejection in Nazareth underscores the challenges of speaking the truth to people who are unwilling to listen. And what occurred here in the synagogue of Jesus' hometown of Nazareth underscores the challenge of speaking the truth to, to those that won't listen and what occurs in every county, every town, every home just about. In many homes, the Bible isn't open, it isn't read, it isn't lived, it isn't obeyed, and the book stays closed and hearts are closed to the one who wrote it. And as the Lord closed the book that day, those people closed their hearts, their minds, their eyes, and their ears unto him. And at the bottom of the rejection of the Lord and his will and way is unbelief. That's the basic problem in the world, in the denominations, and among brethren who forsake the way of the Lord. It's unbelief. But he's the Messiah of this deliverance prophecy. He's the Savior. His way is the only way. His words are gracious words that bring salvation and deliverance. We urge you to accept them and to obey them. If you're here today and need to put your faith in Jesus, if you need to confess it, upon turning from your sin, being immersed into the name of the Godhead Three, we urge you to come as together we stand and sing.